From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, from Meme Gods, Tank Sinatra, and L.A. County Deputy District Attorney, John McKinney. Plus, we'll do some news with Chris Loxamana, and now, anywhere he goes, even if it's not a college campus, he's considered a visiting lecturer. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. The choice begin on mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing. Max Patterson Studio. Hey, Adam. Up the tank and uh, John and uh, all that. Um, so, uh, lots to get to. We were talking about the insane LA City Council woman who was talking about catalytic converters yesterday. Uh, but we didn't play the tape. There's there's audio of it that I want to get into. Uh, there's also uh, Tucker Carlson has moved on. Uh, I don't have any inside information on it, uh, although I'll, I can probably get some at some point. Um, can we I, just do conspiracies then? What do you what do you think happened? Um, I so there's. So Tucker Carlson is, is misunderstood in general. Um, he's said to me he's a writer, essentially. He does not necessarily like being in front of the camera per se. Um, I don't think most people understand those who of, of us who don't really want to be in front of the camera. I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It's unnatural. It's it's you, you, they put makeup on you, and then they futz around with your hair, and then they give you wardrobe shit to try on. And I don't like any of it. I, I never have. I the worst day for me would be we're gonna go out shopping for clothes, and you're gonna try stuff on. Okay, being in front of the camera is a perpetual. <laughs> And, and never ending, try this on. I, I've seen Tucker Carlson getting ready. You know, I've seen him like hit the makeup chair. It lasts about a minute and 25 seconds. Like, yeah, yeah, come on. It's because it, it seems you put this stuff on your face and then you have to take it off as, as soon as you're done. It, it seems like the ultimate waste of time. And, and I, you can tell a lot from people by their hair. Now, so w- what it is, is it's a it's a woman's dream to be in front of cameras because it's nothing but people putting makeup on you and doing your hair and trying shit on. Yeah. I never liked it. I, I never liked doing Loveline, the TV show. I want, you know, I want to talk. I want to, you know, people go, uh, well, you like this, you like that. What do you want to do? I go, I want to take my words. I want to put them in your head. That's it. I don't want to be seen doing it. I'd like to do it while you have earbuds on and you're walking on a trail or driving in your car. I don't want you to watch me do it. I don't think there's anything to gain from it. And I think it detracts from the message. I think you're much better, much better way to take words and put them into your head is to you walk down a trail with your earbuds on and listen to anybody versus the visual part. So he sits down in the makeup chair. I just saw him do this. And they start like messing around with his hair. And he goes, that, 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 who cares? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Like he, he doesn't, I've never seen anyone not put a little spray or a little gel or something, a comb. Doesn't even do the comb. That's not he, important to him. He just goes, yeah. get that, uh, what are we doing here? We're not <laughs> running a fucking beauty contest. Like, I don't care. Get get away. The, the, I mean, he's nice about it, but he doesn't care. He, he thinks of himself as a writer who has to deliver what he writes, but I don't think he's a fan of it, of, of being like in front face. of the camera. Yeah. Now, you know, then people could say, well, Tucker or Adam, like, if you don't want to be on camera, then, then don't be on camera. I mean, and they're right. But 
there's a kind of a job part of it. You know, it's like, do I want to be on stage in front of people at a club or a theater? Uh, no, but I don't mind it. And, and I get paid, you know what I mean? Like, like I didn't want to be up on the roof of a building when I was working construction, but it's my job. And then I got paid. And so there's way too much like, well, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Like, yeah, okay. That's the new world order. But then there's the other part of the world order where you have bills and people relying on you and you have to have to do stuff. So I did Love Line, the TV show. I never looked forward to it. I never wanted to do it. I always wanted to go home. The second it was done, I did not like being on TV. And then I did the radio version of it, which I always enjoyed and looked forward to doing because I wasn't being seen. I didn't like the makeup and the hair. and I didn't like being seen. I liked talking. And I, I think Tucker has a healthy dose of that. Uh, number one. Sure, I, I remember when you were talking to him about his day in the life. He actually took a lot more pride in his writing than uh, than any of the production or TV stuff. Right? He was like, "Oh yeah, I wake up, I work on the monologue all day, and then I just deliver it right right during yes. the show." But he's he a he's a writer. I do not know that he's a sort of ham. I, I don't think he's a ham. Um, he is independent he's kind of an independent thinker now i think people have a thing where they're like they sort of lump all the fox hosts in into like one basket sure. you better keep the have the party line and tow the fox line and stuff like that he talks about things on his show that have nothing to do with fox or trump or biden or whatever he's he's all he gets into all kinds of of subjects his last segment was a pizza delivery guy <laughs> right he'll talk about bees and and stuff like yeah. that and aliens and stuff he's he's a generally interested in a lot of subjects kind of guy um he's also as he states every time he comes on this show has a strong will for sort of independence he didn't want to go he does not the kind of guy who likes to get picked up in the town car and taken to downtown Manhattan and going through the security with the key card and all that. He I don't think he likes that. He he moved away from all of that. He wants his like sort of autonomy and anyone who's been to his studio knows it's like way off the beaten path. It's like an unmarked building. There's nothing around him. There's, there's barely any staff. Like he, he wants that. So I presume he wants to move on and do his own thing. I don't, I don't know what form that'll show up in, but the press release said that Fox and Tucker agreed to part ways. Do you believe that? I mean, it, it's sort of like, uh, I well, he was the number one show on their their network, so I don't know why they'd want to want to get rid of him. Yeah, I don't know what Fox's angle is or what they what they think is going to happen now or what they plan on doing. I mean, that that was their golden boy. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? I I assume he's look. There's a there's a time in your career where you want to be hooked up with a big network and have a platform and be with a brand, you know, and that was the old world order. You wanted to be on ABC, NBC, sitcom, you know, sort of prime time, you know, and, and then it started to kind of branch out into like, oh, you could be on HBO too or Showtime or something. And now it's, you know, Netflix. And now it's like, fuck it. You could just do your own podcast and have your own YouTube channel or, or whatever it is. It's, it's just, it's completely scattered to the wind now. And usually when people get to a certain point in their career, at the beginning, you're just kind of looking for a gig. And then at some point after you get the gig, that lasts for X amount of years. And then at some point you want autonomy. You're not looking for the gig anymore. You're looking to do what you want to do the way you want to do it and to probably be left alone. Right. And I, it's probably the phase, you know, where, where Tucker is in. I mean, he was, 
you know, five years ago when he did this show, five, six years ago, when he first had the idea of, I want to be out of the office. I want to do my own thing. I want to do it from where I want to do it. That's the first thought. And then the second thought is, I want to just go some, I want to get rid of the office and the network altogether and just completely do what I want to do. So I, that's what I'm assuming. But look, I don't know. He could have an illness for, for the, for all oh, we sure. know. I don't, I don't know, but I will, I will. But it is weird that this came just days after the whole Dominion settlement with Fox and, you know, his text were leaked and he wasn't towing the line of like, you know, he, he criticized Trump in there. He criticized lawyers. Uh, he did compliment the Fox audience privately, which is kind of cool. I thought that he gave them credit for being a good audience and that they're smarter than we think. But the yeah, just it, it is weird that this comes just days after that settlement. I, I don't know. Maybe it's connected. I I would have no idea. Like I'll I'll find out is what is what I'm yeah. is what I'm saying. I'll get I'll get to the bottom of this because he uh, he has to do something soon, right? I mean, I imagine he's going to launch his own. Network in he, the next day or so. There's one thing about him is he's the one of the most earnest, truthful people I've ever met in my life. So I, I he will tell me whatever's going on as soon as I get hold of him. I just didn't want to pounce on him today because I figure his this phone's is probably yeah. blowing up. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, I well, sent him a text though. Yeah, and um, also part of the shrapnel in, the, in today's bomb was that Don Lemon got fired from CNN as well. I, which t- seems totally strategic yes. that they do it. They do it today. Yeah, Don Lemon is a crazed narcissist, I think, and it's also kind of what happens. What ends up happening when you're in a sort of endangered species, like you know, I'm gay, I'm black, so I could say whatever I want. You can't do anything about it. It, it leads people down a, a, a road that I've said is no good. It's like. I've said a million times, remember, and, and they start getting kind of used to it. So then they start saying stuff and then eventually people notice and then they're out of a job. It's the same thing that happened with Lori Lightfoot. Remember, she got caught cutting her hair while she was fucking arresting people for walking around the well, lake. She cares about her hygiene. Yeah. And she's like, she didn't go, I'm sorry. I know it makes me look like a hypocrite. She was just like, yeah, well, I'm going to get my hair cut bitches. So fuck off. That's the answer you give when you're a lesbian and you're black. If if you're a white dude with red hair, you have to go like, oh, I need to apologize because I, I miss, you know, whatever. No, no. Fuck off. So I think Don Lemon just sort of got used to saying whatever he wanted to say because he was like, oh, you can't fire me. I'm black he and I'm gay. He was, he was getting <laughs> right. well unhinged. At <laughs> right. <laughs> and so at a certain point, whether it's Lori Lightfoot or Don Lemon, people go, well, we've heard enough. Yeah. At a certain point. It just takes a long time. Because they're endangered species. He actually re- released a statement already. He did. Yeah. Quote, I was informed this morning by my agent that I have been terminated by CNN. I am stunned after 17 years at CNN. I would have thought that someone in management would have had the decency to tell me directly. Well, they would if they like you. See, yeah. if they like you, then they take you out to lunch. Right. They don't like Don Lemon. They soften the blow. Well, I mean, he was already he was already having his fall from grace, right? Get, got, he got a show canceled he got put on that morning show became like a field reporter um variety published uh, an expose on on him being abusive to yeah the women. And i see here's the thing about don lemon or many of these people that got shit can i don't think he brings anything to the table see tucker carlson has a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts and and they're they're interesting thoughts so he will go somewhere where he can share those thoughts I don't, I don't know what Don Lemon's thoughts are. Uh, I don't know how interesting they are, and I don't know where he's going. Right. He's going to – see, you can't cancel Bill Maher, and you can't cancel Dave Chappelle, and you can't cancel Louis C.K., and you can't cancel Tucker Carlson, but you can cancel the host from The Bachelor. There, you can just fucking hit the bricks, Chris. They're whoever. You're, yeah. They're We don't need you. You we because we don't need to hear what you have to say. Right. There, there. So if someone has something to say, some audience will find them. If if we don't have anything to say, and I don't think Don Lemon particularly has anything to say, then he's just going to leave, mm-hmm. like a like a game show host. Sure. Where we just get rid of you. That'll be the end of that. All right. So the other thing. 
I wanted to get into was um, two subjects. One is oh the catalytic converter clip. All right, I, I want to hear. I want to hear. <laughs> we this talked moment. about this on yesterday's pod, but yeah. The, but here's the actual LA here's Council. the actual clip. Just so you know, maybe the leader in the clubhouse of Chick Vic. This is 100% Chick Vic. This person is is making policies involved with policies in in Los Angeles, <laughs> and now we're fucked. And what, you know, when people, Doctor Drew says every ten minutes to me, "What's next? What's going on?" For ten years, I say, "Safe spaces and octagons." This woman and her ilk are going to cause. It's the reason I spent last weekend looking at real estate in Nevada. They're right. just going to, everyone's going to leave and go to the octagon and the safe spaces people can hang around and have ideas like the following. We'll play them. Instead of responding to it with work, with urgency, with focus on actually addressing the issue, we say, oh, we'll just ban it. We'll just, we'll just ban it and that'll be the end of it. Instead of actually thinking about what is going to address this issue in a very real way. In this case, I think one of the things that really infuriates me is that we have a company, a, you know, the pre, whatever, Toyota, who makes the Prius, um, that essentially has a device on their cars, which is super easy to remove. It's basically the value of a MacBook, right? That is put in a place that is incredibly easy to access in your car. And then the thefts related to this issue. All right, hold on a second. It <laughs> it's incredibly easy to access a pipe that runs down the center of your car. This is a big under the car pipe. This is a piece of <laughs> incredible. It's super easy to remove. Yeah, yeah. You just need a fucking. There's never a one man twenty two volt this, by the sawzall way. and a fucking floor jack. Yeah, and. And a, and a getaway driver. Easy. Every, everyone has and, that. You have that in your pantry or something, right? It's not super easy. to. I, the, the guy filming's laughing, by the way. I don't know if you can hear him. He's <laughs> snickering as he's recording this. Well, all right. Sorry. We'll we'll play it out for you. So. Put in a place that is incredibly easy to access in your car. And then the thefts okay. related to this issue have essentially all of the costs of that are given to us to bear instead of them having to manufacture a car. That actually is not so easy to be stolen. I- yeah. Uh, first off, I didn't even know what she's talking about. The, the, the stealing of the car, stealing of the catalytic converter. There's a, you know, I talked to Dr. Drew about this. He says he's talked to Arnold Schwarzenegger about, you know, government uh-huh. and like people. He's like, Arnold Schwarzenegger said to Dr. Drew, you have no idea how stupid these people are. Like you have no idea what you're going to be dealing with. You're, we're, we're not, we're in the private sector. We're used to dealing with people that are smart. These are some of the dumbest people. We, we have no idea. I mean, I've said it a million times. They sound like fucking babbling fools. Yeah. This is insane. But, but it would, it would astonish you. Even Arnold. It just here's me. what I want to say. Here's what I always say. Um, when the husband walks out in the ostrich boots that are bright red and, and, and goes out to dinner, what do I always say? <laughs> I do not blame him. I blame his wife. Somebody should have stopped him before he left the house and said, We're not, you're not going to wear those. Um, is there any member of the city council and or her husband or a colleague or loved one who, when she goes, here's my angle. I'm blaming Toyota for putting this part on their car and making it so no one ever taps them on the shoulder and goes, I, it, let's work a different angle. Right. Like, let, let's work the part. Like, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to try to decriminalize uh, owning and selling catalytic converters, but I'm working the brown and black angle. Like I'm working the poor person, doesn't have an opportunity, gets involved with the legal sales of catalytic converters. Then he gets to strike on his record, and now he can't find a job. Yeah. That's my angle. I know you're working the angle of it's super easy 
to remove this, we should blame Toyota. Yeah. I d- think that's a winning angle. <laughs> you, you know it's what I mean? It's a little bit like, of a reach. It's a little bit of a reach. First off, everybody gets their catalytic converter stolen. So you're blaming Toyota, but Toyota makes a, 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 car. a car where you get the catalytic converter so but so does nissan so does and so does gmc and yeah. so does honda and so does chevy and ford shall i keep going <laughs> like I, this is a weird angle and you're gonna seem like a fucking crazy person when you do this you're gonna see people are gonna be laughing at you this is gonna fucking end up on the internet and you're gonna seem like a dollar fucking buffoon don't do it let's right. work another angle but, and by the way when you do any endeavor, I do it all the time. Like I talk to people, I go, I got this idea for a joke or I got this idea for a, a, a series or a plot line or something like that. Like, what do you think? And then people go, oh yeah, I can see that. Or mm, I don't, I don't know. I'm not yeah, feeling it. Like I might go off them. this way. Whenever I uh, go out to dinner with uh, Chris Morgan from Fast and Furious. He's always telling me, like, okay, I got this idea. You know, like, oh, I got this this thing. What do you think of this? Uh, what about this idea for a movie? You know, whatever. He's constantly, like, pitching things. And then I pitch things to him because we want to know if our ideas are good or not. Yeah. Like, do you tell Chris when his ideas are bad? I tell him, like, I you know, th- this sounds like uh, like kind of far-fetched, but maybe if you did it this way, it would be okay, less tr- far-fetched or yeah. something, you know. But she needs to bounce her horrible ideas off of people before she gets up to the microphone so they could nip it in the, in the bud because she's explaining how incredibly easy it is for people to steal. Yeah, and look, she's well-educated. She's a Harvard grad. <laughs> I think that's the problem. Now, anyway, these people are making policy. So we're fucked, everybody. The other, at least if you live in Los Angeles, you are. And I don't know when it, when this became a thing of just basically electing nut job broads to make policy, but it is not good. Right. It is a bad, bad thing, and, and why, we are fucked. And why is it so hard to criticize them publicly? I mean, you have no problem, but a lot of people do to where – is it because, because look, that, yeah, they they actually are now bec- – they've become the squeakiest wheel. They're the loudest. And if, if you criticize them or their point that, hey, they, like let's not bring race into this, let's not bring the black and brown communities into this, then you will become a pariah. Well, the first thing they do is they run – on race and gender and whatever. So you go, uh, Kamala Harris is the first woman of color to be vice president. They keep beating you over the head with the first woman of color. I'm not sure why they go along with it. Like if people had, if Kamala Harris had dignity, she would say, I don't want to, I don't want to be given a job based on my gender and my race. I want it to do based on my accomplishments. This is insane. Uh, So anyway, the point is, is, you beat everyone over the head with you are, this is the first woman of color, blah, 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 or first gay, you know, blah, blah, blah. They beat everyone over the head with it. Okay. Then if you criticize that person, you're not criticizing them and their ideas. You're criticizing the first gay woman Ah. of color. So now you're taking a stand against gay women of color. Not horrible shrews ideas. And now you're not against bad policy. You are... You're against you're, her. Yeah, you're racist and, and right, homophobic. Right. That, yeah. this, the, but this is why they beat you over the head with it. So then they then they escape critique. That's that's how it works. Uh, you look, Gavin Newsom gets bashed for horrible policy all the time, but nobody calls those people homophobic or racist or anything. They just go, that guy's fucking got a 10 cent head and everyone attacks him but if you attack her then you'll get attacked for you know racism sexism whatever it is that's why they push it out there sure it'd be a nice card to play or whatever you you look you can be shitty at your job and not get fired because nobody wants to be called homophobic or xenophobic or racist or sexist or misogynist whatever it is um the other thing uh, apropos of nothing, I don't know where you guys are at with this. I cannot get human beings to round up or down. 
Now, I'm not sure if it's a kind of a chick thing or it's a chick and dude thing. I think it's a chick and dude thing. Can't do it. People can't do it. So what happens is you go out and you look at real estate, right? And there's only two questions in real estate, which is how big and how much? Those are the, like the <laughs> two questions. The two questions are how many square feet, how much? Those are the, you know, when you're looking at house, they're going, we're going to go look at a house yeah. in Henderson. You know, you know how know. big, how much, yeah. how big, how much? That's all, all you say. And at some point, They'll go, uh, it's uh, 3,986 uh, square feet. And then at some point I'll go, just say 4,000. Just say 4,000. Because there's too many numbers swimming in, in my head. Just start saying 4,000. Yeah, or so, just under 4,000. I If it's 3,986 square feet, we'll just say 4,000. All right. And then at some point you go, uh, and then how much? And they go, uh, one million twenty six eight seventy seven. And then I go, it's it's one point it's one point two six. And they go, no, it's it's one million twenty six thousand eight hundred and seventy seven dollars. And I'll go, just say a million dollars. Just say a million dollars. It really in in the, in this world, what we're talking. You're you're right, but I bet there are other people. That get upset when they do rounds. Like, hey, you told me this was four thousand, and it's fifteen square feet less. Ah, uh, there may be some of there may be that individual. <laughs> I haven't met him, nor do I care to. But if you make the declaration multiple times of just round it up yeah. or round it down, it just just just, just hit even it. it out. Because if you look at twenty properties. All that's going to be in your head is 4,000 oh, yeah. square foot, a million. Once they start burying you with numbers, you start swimming. It's no longer memorable. They can't do it. It's not a doable that thing. That's too... No, you can't commit memory. They can't round up or round down. And they won't do I, it for you. Yeah. I've asked, I've, I've told people <laughs> multiple, multiple times, just just do that. Yeah. Just do that. They can't in any arena. Why, you, why would you not want to make it easier for everybody? That's the whole point. <laughs> There are certain like enzymes in people's <laughs> heads that are like missing and rounding up and rounding down is a key feature that is missing in most human beings. They cannot, they can't do it. They, they cannot do it. They can't do it when they're saying like, uh, 39.8 uh, Arme of the Armenian community FICO scores under I just say just say 40%. Yeah. Just say 40% Armenians have low credit rate or whatever it is. They can't do it. I don't know what it is. I'd like to look into it. I've tried many times. Most things that you ask of people are not achievable by that person in real time. <laughs> If you learn that from like Mike August and like other people where you go, don't do this of or course. just do that. Yeah. And they just go, right. I used to teach In boxing. I would just go, hey, you throw the throw the right. Don't drop the left. Yeah. And they throw the right. Don't drop the left. Throw the right. They just do it. They do it. They do it in real time, 10 times in a row. And then at a certain point I'd go, hey, stop dropping your left. And they go, what are you yelling about? And I'd go, <laughs> You're not doing this thing that I keep telling you to do or right. not to do. It's a fucking bizarre. We can't break rhythm that easily. Oh my god! The tendency. I don't even know what the. I I get the fizz. I get the part where you pull your head out on your golf swing or I've something. I've been trying to fix my golf swing for a long uh, but, time. But I don't really get the round up or round down part. Yeah. I, I really don't. I you, you you can just do it. It's a weird concept. All right. Anyway, I'll complain more about that later. Tank Sinatra is going to join us. We'll yes. take a uh, quick break. We'll talk to him right after this. All right. Let me tell you about Babbel. Look, uh, you're traveling. Maybe you're going abroad. Maybe it's a summer trip. Communication is the key to experiencing a new culture. Other than that, you just end up sitting at some you know chain restaurant that's down the street from your house. No, you got to get in. You have to immerse yourself in the culture. Am I right, Max Zapata? Yeah, when I went to Italy last year, I 
it really helped. Even just learning a few key phrases, some numbers, it made the experience so much more enjoyable. And it sounds daunting to learn a whole new language, but if it's an app on your phone, it makes it enjoyable way easier, too. Yeah, it's a language learning app. That's what Babbel is. And it's sold over 10 million subscriptions. It's addictively fun, and it's easy to learn a new language. And it teaches you bite-sized 10-minute lessons so you can start having real conversations in as little as three weeks. Choose from 14 different languages created by 150 language experts, not AI. And they got a 20-day money-back guarantee. So let's get going with some Babbel, folks. Right, Dawson? Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, save up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash Adam. That's babbel.com slash Adam for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. And now, Alcoa presents Definitely Not a Jew on the Adam Carolla Show. Dateline, Euclid, Ohio. No charges were filed against a 62-year-old woman who called 911 after she did not get her full order at the drive-thru of KFC. Definitely not a Jew. Tank Sinatra on the show. He is a um, legend in the meme world and is featured quite prominently in a doc that uh, my company is producing. Meme Gods, the world premiere, I guess you'll be out here Sunday, and uh, I'm going to be there as well. It's in Los Angeles, Lumiere Cinema. Right. And, uh, there are tickets available, too, if anybody's in the L.A. area wants to come. Just go to adamcroll.com. Yeah, it's a, it's a good doc. Have you seen the final product, Tank? Um, first of all, hello. Good to be here. Hello. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I've seen, I think about as close to a final product as we have right now. Nate said there was some tweaks that were going to be made. Nothing I'm going to notice, uh, as a, a lay person, but it looks great. It looks like, you know, a story's being told and there's great supporting, uh, you know, talking head stuff from very interesting people. So I'm excited for people to see it. Um, you're, you launched in 2000 and 15 and i know we've talked to you about it before it's, yeah. also, it's also insane that uh we're living in a time when that you make your <laughs> living captioning pictures <laughs> but uh and also is it something you felt like you had a gift for like when you're in high school i know memes didn't exist but i mean were you scrolling things down like like when when someone presented you a yearbook where you put in little captions underneath the guy's dorky picture or something like that? No, you know what? As you asked that, um, I've always loved comedy. I think I was like, a, I like to caption moments. So nothing to me was better than like, even if it wasn't a well-crafted joke, a well-timed, well-placed comment in a conversation that was maybe a millisecond before the other funny guy. Mm -hmm. And then I beat him to the punch and it was just kind of thinking quick. So that, I guess, translates a little bit to memes. Did you, were you class clown? Were, were you popping off in high school? Oh, I was popping off, yeah. <laughs> I uh, Eighth grade, they nixed the class clown uh, category, which was devastating to me. But then in 12th grade, I got it, and we did a ridiculous photo shoot. They almost didn't let us do it. But um, I, I love funny people. I love being funny. I think being funny is not only a gift, but a skill. So I've always surrounded myself with with funny people. I just don't see the point of not being funny if you have the ability to. Why be so serious? Life is obviously serious enough, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with you philosophically, although I have found myself not wanting to waste my funny on undeserving ears. Like oh, you for can, sure. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if you saw me have lunch with my mom and my stepdad you'd think i was the most serious fucking person on the planet you'd have no idea what i what i do for a living because there's such a horrible audience that yeah. i find myself just like i've i've there are people it's like when i met jimmy kimmel it was a contest to see who could make the other person laugh harder 
you know, like yeah. it was immediately like a muse, like, oh man, am I going to make you laugh? Oh yeah, I'm going to make you laugh. And whenever I hang out with Jimmy, that's, that's what we do. But you get me in front of some of my family members and stuff like that. I barely talk because it's like, why should I fucking waste whatever I got on your fucking <laughs> raggedy ass? I know I sound like the biggest dick in the world, but it's their fault. <laughs> they never said like, oh, that's amusing or that's funny. You should write that down or even laughed. So I've been, I figured it out. Like, I'm not I'm not going to bother dancing in front of these people who have no rhythm. Well, yeah, you don't want to squander your genius. You that's know? right. And on. Glad you said it. <laughs> On the other hand, I like you said, you met Jimmy Kim, Jimmy Kimmel. I've definitely met people who turn me on uh, humor wise, and I'm just funnier around those people. When I was doing stand up, I used to pretend that my friend Adam, who's in the movie, also was in the crowd, and I was just trying to make him laugh. You know? Oh, which really? Was yeah. <laughs> good exercise. That's a good. That's like an interesting exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So Tank, I um I just had a question because it seems like anybody can make a meme these days. I mean, I'm not saying anybody can, but everybody tries to, right? I mean, it's it now yeah. the world's become just saturated with with anybody. So yeah, I can, there are generators online. Is it possible to start a meme account today with how, how many there are now and how many people are just doing it, or is it is it? Did you get? Do you think you got it at the right time? Listen, dude, I thought I was late in 2015 because other accounts already existed, yeah. you know, and then I, I brought my own individual unique life and voice to the page and people liked it. Listen, you, you could start a page, it could go nowhere, but if you're starting something to make it explode, that might be the wrong motivation also. Yeah. Um, you know, if you just feel like you have a creative bug you need to let loose or, or a scratch you need to itch you need to scratch, then yeah, for sure. Um, don't expect anything though, but don't expect anything out of life in general is good advice. <laughs> yeah, I you think know, so. yeah, just I, do what you like. Adam, have you seen the account influencers in the wild? No, it's, it's something that tank does and it's, uh, and it's just, what is it? It's just like people just take videos of other people trying to do their TikTok dances. Oh yes. Their... Yes. I have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Basically just breaks the fourth wall and before the filters, before the, uh, you know, the, the tweaking and the caption and all that editing and stuff. Looks a lot less glamorous. It's... Yes. Yeah. 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 So after, yeah. so after seeing all these influencers in the wild and like where, and social media is going, I know you're a dad. Are you leaning into your kids being involved with social media or are you trying to get them to stay away from it? Cause you've seen what it does or what can happen. Um, well, my son has already started doing uh, Roblox edits on YouTube and counting his views and counting his followers, which to me, I know that game and it's painful. I'm trying to get him to stay away from like, oh, dad, I got this many views on a video. But I also obviously see very much myself in him in that and just every human being. It feels good to get attention. I don't care what anybody says. That's why the influencers in the wild account, people think I'm making fun of uh, the individual in the video, I'm not. I'm I'm shining light or uh, elevating the behavior, which I think is fascinating and interesting and sometimes funny and inappropriate. More so than anything, it's fascinating to me that we have put attention up there with like hunger and sex drive. You know what I mean? It's that important to people now. So I'm just I'm enthralled by it. I um, I don't know why, but this just popped into my head. It has nothing to do with memes. Tank probably have a thought, and tell me you guys in general. Like I, 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 I marvel into this microphone on a daily basis about what the fuck with everybody all the time. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, how about this? And and this is another thing you learn when you go out looking for real estate or whatever. The concept of follow me to the next house, like just, just, just follow me, just, just following people, like my. My dad, I remember once like a million years ago, like I said, uh, the restaurants like down the street or whatever, just, just follow me. And yeah. he attempts to follow me in his car, except for he leaves 2000 yards between his car and my car. Me. And then people start <laughs> sliding in. Yeah. And then at some point he misses the signal oh, that I make. <laughs> and then I pull into the Seven Eleven driveway, but someone's backing out and like someone's honking at me. And it's like, most people where I go, just just follow me, they can't do it. They'll right. refuse to do it or something. I don't they won't change whatever the speed is that they drive the car or something. The it's it like can't. I'm not saying bump draft me down the back straight <laughs> at Talladega. I'm saying just 
tuck in behind me and just sort of stay there for several blocks until we get to this this place. What what is this thing? Why do I always end up cursing the person and like looking in my rear view and then like having to pull over? Like, what is the thing about follow me? You what? guys got no driving chemistry. You, you don't, you know, you got to drive similar at least. But I would argue that unless the person is doing something like reckless, it is not your choice to drive your way when you are following somebody. Your job <laughs> is to drive temporarily how they drive. Yeah, and you're following them. So you, you're, just you're, you're following seeing them. it being done. Uh, right. You can do it. <laughs> like you may, you may normally do 55 instead of 63. But for this brief moment in time, check your ego at the door yeah. and drive 63 miles an hour. In the There's freeway. an example like, of it happening right in front of people you. People follow you and then just drive how they drive. And then all then that's where the big gap and then people start sliding in and then you can't see them. And then that's you're exactly not sure right. if they can see you signaling to get off the freeway. Anytime somebody has to follow me, I get anxiety because I already know this isn't going to go. <laughs> well. not gonna work. Oh, I re I refuse to play that game. My, my dad, you know, he pretends not to know how GPS works. It's very simple. He knows how to text. He still wants directions. He still wants to give directions, following. <laughs> it's not happening anymore, man. It's uh, fucking, I can't do it. I can't explain to you to make a right at the tree that looks like, uh, you know, a, a question mark. You know what I mean? I'm going to miss it. I would be, I, 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 I think it should be taught in school, the concept of, it is. We, we grab the kid in front of his belt loop and you, you yes, just walk just around. Fucking, I mean, I guess with ways and everything else now, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but it is, there's something simple, quaint and friendly when the person goes, I could text you the way, but it's just, it's up the street. Just follow me to the place. Yeah. I, I like that relationship. It's human. It's, true. it's not, it's not a computer or, or AI taken uh, over. This is this is old school. AI cannot replace this simple activity of your organic intelligence, right? Yes. Or yes. <laughs> Real intelligence. Well, not you might, I don't know. You have any thoughts about AI? Like how, how about AI replacing you with me? Oh man. Um I f I mean obviously I'm aware of it, but I feel like I'm not utilizing it to the max. I'm trying to follow people on Twitter um who talk about it a lot and give different prompts and ways to use it. But it's kind of like when, when Google first came out, you could find out anything you wanted to find out. You just didn't know what you wanted to find out. You didn't really care. Uh, you know, who, if you couldn't remember an actor's name or something, you could use Google, but back then it wasn't that great. I feel like AI is kind of like people don't even, and me included, don't even know what prompts to put into it to maximize it. And I'd say we're probably three to five years before AI becomes commonplace used every day. But for like generating scripts, um, I asked it to write me a three minute script for a video that I was doing. 99% there. Wow. I changed a couple of words. It was about a specific topic with, you know, uh, I asked it to speculate about something and it had all the information. I guess it pulls from Google or whatever. Um, it's really interesting. And I'm not scared of it at all. People are scared of it. I'm like, what, what are you scared of? People have been scared I follow this account, The Pessimist Archive, on Twitter, which I think you guys would really like. It's just about, you know, articles from the 1890s about uh, books are going to ruin the way kids communicate and writing, uh, writing tools and paper and pen. We're going to we're going to ruin interpersonal communication. It's just like we've always been looking down the wrong, you know, looking at the wrong lens of how things are going to go bad instead of how they're going to go right. I feel like the pessimist archive would retweet a lot of Adam stuff. Anyway, yeah. So I, I basically <laughs> yeah. follow it. The, well, so I was thinking, I was explaining this to somebody, but I, I, I was just being a pompous douche, but I don't, I don't really know if this to be true, but you know, there's the concept of, well, then maybe AI replaces you doing your stand up or your podcast or, you know, whatever. And I said, well, you know, we have this guest who hasn't been on in a while, but everyone loved him, uh, which is uh, Brian Whitman. Hmm. And Brian Whitman could do a dead nuts impression 
of a radio show host that was in LA, pretty popular, uh, named Tom Likas. He does a dead nuts Tom Likas. And he's so dead nuts on that I've always said if Tom Likas missed a shift at the old radio station, Brian Whitman, if you told him, like, don't fucking fuck around, like, we, you know, we need we need people to think this is Tom Likas, he could <laughs> he, do it. He'd pull it off, yeah. Yeah. He could do it, but it was mainly because he was good. He could do the voice, but also Tom Likas would just sort of say a lot of the same stuff in a, in a circle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was pretty, he could, he could, he could capture it and he could do it. And then when I was being pompous, I said to this person, people do an impression of me, but they can't, they don't know what I know. They go, man, 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 plywood, man, 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 two by fours, (laughs) but they can't tell you what it really is or how to build it or something because they don't know what I know. They always do a man, 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 and then they say something about building supplies, but they, they never really do it. You know what I mean? But maybe, so that's why AI is not going to replace me, but maybe it will. Maybe it it is going to do it. Yeah. I mean, as far as the the application for memes goes and jokes and being able to, I don't know if if AI could extract an emotional story from a picture and make it funny. I mean, it might be able to create them both together, write a joke and then make a a picture to go along with it. But I mean, it's pretty far away from where it needs to be. I've tried that. Doesn't work. I think memes are really it, they're they're it's they're really topical. They're they're they change along with society as well. So I don't see AI kind of grabbing onto that as fast as what was the three us. minute AI speech you wanted it to compose? It's for this uh this Snapchat t- uh, tile that I have called Natty or Not, where I talk about whether or not fitness influencers or celebrities are on steroids. Basically, they all are, but I tease a little bit. And uh, I think I asked it. The first one was for Cali Muscle, who's this huge black guy. He spent time in prison, super jacked, always talked about being natural. And I said, you know, write a three minute script because the videos are supposed to be three minutes. Uh, Write a three minute script about Cali Muscle and his uh, physique, the time he spent in prison and the way he presents himself as a nat- uh, as a natural bodybuilder, but then speculate about whether or not he's natural. And it had all kinds of information in there about, you know, YouTube videos that he put out, what year it was, what he said in it. It was crazy. Yeah. It was wild. But, you know, I've had some failures on ChatGPT as well. Right. I mean, it's not perfect, but it is alarmingly. Is anybody going to ever do homework ever again? <laughs> is anyone I mean, ever going to write a term paper? Read a, I can't a book imagine report. you would put the effort in to that when you just know that you can be as specific as you want. And it, there's nothing, it's not like when you bought term papers online and there was a way for them to find out if you did that. These are all bespoke, uh, generated on the spot, depending on what prompts you put in. And you can have it tweaked. You can say, make it unlike anything else that you can find on the internet. Uh, do it in the voice of some famous historian, if it's a history paper, right. you know? Um, I don't know. It's it's really interesting, brand new. I don't want to get left behind. I feel like as far as technology goes, I've been in the right spot my entire life because I, I was raised on bikes and pools and scraped knees. And then when I became a teenager, AOL came out. Then MySpace came out when I was 22. Social media took over. I was already old enough to not get completely sucked into it. Um, but you know, now AI is here and it's like, it's a new... So things are definitely going to change yeah. for sure. When I went to college, we had to submit our papers through this system, this uh, online system that would basically scour the internet, making sure you didn't copy or paste anything. Really? Yeah. And, that, and that it was organically written. But now with AI, there's no way you can really police that. I, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, everything's bespoke. No. Um, no way. Oh, Tank, what are your thoughts on Elon and Twitter right now? I mean, he took away all the blue check marks. <laughs> He's kind of just doing his own thing. He's going... I don't. I don't. I just want to know what you think about it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion about Elon Musk either way. I feel like he's got some kind of magic to him that's apparent and obvious, but he's also very much human and kind of like a little nerdy kid at times. Yeah. You know what I mean? He bought a huge platform, um, to be able to say whatever he wants whenever he wants, which is good. Um. But it's just, it's a strange, you know, it's just, it was a strange move, I thought, on his part. But we'll see how it turns out. I heard that he wanted to 
uh, use it, the verification thing as a payment verification so that he could use Twitter as a payment portal, kind of like, um, what's that, co- that Chinese company? TikTok? No, no, no. Jack Ma, the guy oh. who, uh, Alipay, he wanted to make it like Alipay, where you would one day be able to pay with Twitter, maybe using Dogecoin. I don't know. Oh. I feel like to speculate about what he's doing, he's so many moves ahead <laughs> of even, obviously, the average person, but even a very savvy person. Um, I have no idea. I, I am enjoying it, though. It's funny. It's yeah, funny to watch him <laughs> try and figure it out. <laughs> but, like, isn't Meta doing that with, like, Instagram, too, now? Are they... Like they, uh, you can pay for verification and all that stuff. And do you think they're going to go do the same thing? Yeah. I don't know if paying for verification on Instagram, um, has the, it, I don't think it was the same intention. They may be taking his intention and trying to figure out some kind of payment thing on their own, but like Facebook pay or whatever it is, but even Facebook pay is still visa or MasterCard or American express. It's not its own standalone system, which I think Elon is trying to do. I could be way off. That was what I heard or read mm-hmm. months ago when he first bought it. I saw his uh, interview with Tucker Carlson, and I just am so impressed by that guy. But I also get depressed while I'm being impressed. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm always like, first off, he was asked, you know, questions about aliens and AI and everything under the sun. And he had like a good, cogent, point about every single one of them and then i'm always like why can't this guy be in charge of something to do with our country like why and then i see the politicians being interviewed and they seem like such fucking dimwits he doesn't want yeah it's insane that the that it attracts dimwits this this profession i mean whether it's local or on a national stage it's so insane and all i do when i listen to that guy is go why can't he make some policy like why can't i would let him do whatever he wanted to do based on his brain being twice the size of everyone else and then you turn on cnn and there's some politician babbling about something and they don't even sound coherent Yeah, no, it's crazy. Did you guys talk about uh, Tucker leaving Fox already before I was on? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I I mean, it's a shock for sure. I think. I mean, I don't. I don't know what the insiders knew, but uh, I feel like he's probably onto greener pastures. You know, he may have outgrown Fox. He seemed like towards the end that he was kind of like, "What are we? What am I doing here?" You know what I mean? He. I'm not saying Tucker Carlson is bigger than Fox because Fox is obviously a behemoth, but he was a big part of it. I'll be interested to see what he does afterwards. I don't think he's going to go the route of um, Megyn Kelly. I think he's got more juice than that Me personally. Too. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know? he just, he doesn't belong in a corporation. That's basically my yeah. take on Tucker. You know, last yeah. time I talked to him, he was just barefoot oh, walking yeah. around his hotel, hotel room. He just, doesn't belong in a corporation. Right. It's not his life at all. Up and everybody chew. He doesn't <laughs> up and everyone dip, <laughs> walk around barefoot. Doesn't he doesn't have a TV like he's just not that guy. And and that that feels sort of spiritually what's what's going on. Uh how, but how we'll old find is he? out. How old is Tucker Carlson? He's I think 55, 54. 53, I think. 53, yeah, yeah, he mentioned it. He said it to somebody when he was telling him not to do his hair or something. <laughs> He's like, I'm 53. I don't, you don't have to mess with my hair. Yeah. Um, I, that's my take. I'm going to find out. I will, I will find out from Tucker what he's, what he's up to, and, uh, and I'll report back. He's 53, yeah. according yeah. to this. Yeah. Um, so this movie is exciting. I'm oh, really, yeah. I mean, the it's movie. been two. Yeah. We started filming that thing in like 2016, maybe 2017. Mm-hmm. And it's been a long, long run, long run. And yeah. you guys have really helped, uh, obviously, get it to the point where it's something that's real. So thank you for that. Thanks, Nate, everyone that's worked on it. Um, it's, you know, it started off, we were just filming people who make memes and uh, where they come from and their effect on society and culture. And then, you know, I remember shoot, filming in California and I was like, wait, maybe this movie's about a guy who quit his job to make memes full time and then wound up on the Ellen show. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, um, 
it just objectively became apparent to me that there was a story there because talking heads, informational documentaries are sometimes hard to watch. Mm -hmm. This one weaves a thread and they did a really good job of taking the footage and making it uh, compelling to watch aside from how fun it is. Right. Yeah. I think people get way too caught up in subject matter and not the skill of the people that are assembling the doc. Nate yeah. makes very compelling docs and he could make one on a race car driver or he could make one on memes. It really doesn't matter. It's more, yeah. the, it's like saying, it, in, a, in a weird way, it's sort of like saying, uh, Quentin Tarantino, what's your next movie going to be about? It's going to be like an L.A. reporter. Oh, I'm not interested in L.A. reporters. <laughs> like, it's like, no, it's him. He could be doing something about World War II. He'd be doing something about uh, slavery in the South. He could be doing something about L.A. in the early 70s, the late 60s. It's him doing yeah. it. That's what yeah. people and people need to understand that with docs. It's not the subject. It's who is assembling and telling the the story, uh, Tank. We'll see you yep. out uh, on Sunday at the premiere. It's at uh, Lumiere. Is that how we say yeah. it? Uh, Lumiere Cinema. Cinema, and you can get tickets at adamcarolla.com, and you can come on out and say hi to me and Tank and Nate and everyone else. I think there'll be well. a Q and A after the the movie too, or before or something like that. Yeah, come on out and enjoy the evening. Uh, Meme Daddies is the name of the uh, podcast for uh, Tank, available wherever you listen to finer podcasts. And uh, we'll see you on Sunday, Tank. Yep, looking forward to it. All right, brother, we'll see you soon. All right, well, let's see. We got news. We got John McKinney to uh, tell his very interesting story as well. We'll take a uh, quick break, come back and do that right after this. BetterHelp, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes life bogs you down and you feel overwhelmed. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of yourself. Oh, yeah. A lot going on these days. Social media, just screens in front of everyone, and smartphones. You need to talk to somebody. I'm a strong strong supporter of BetterHelp. So if you're thinking about trying therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, it's flexible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. So you just fill out a brief questionnaire, you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get your head together with BetterHelp, right Dawson? If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. In celebration of Jim Corolla's upcoming 92nd birthday, here's a list of 92 things Jim Corolla has never done. Number 50 said to anyone, you'll be hearing from my attorney. Just one of 92 things Jim Carolla has never done. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla show. I had this uh, thought, and I wonder if it's connected. I mentioned it on stage when I was in Vegas, but I shared it with you guys, which is when I was a kid, every swimming pool had a diving board. Now, that brought some of the most joy I've ever had as a, as a kid. I, of course, didn't live in a house with a pool or a diving board, but my neighbor put in a pool at some point with a diving board, and I would just spend endless hours just bouncing, uh, bouncing, mm -hmm. and there was, a, there was two moves. There was bounce off the diving board, throw the Nerf ball, catch it in the air, you know, hit the water. Uh, and then obviously they got rid of diving boards because X amount of people got paralyzed, bouncing off of them, liability, blah, sure. blah, blah. It's kind of a metaphor for remove everything that's fun because it could possibly cause harm. And then your kids will grow up in a world where they'll never set foot on a fucking diving board, which is tragic to me, but that's the new world order. But there are two things the pool had. The pool had the diving board, they got rid of the diving board. The pool also had the ladder in the deep end yeah. that you would use to climb out of the pool. That left 
the same time the diving board left because now we have no reason to climb out of the pool in the deep end. Yeah, well, now why even have a deep end? (laughs) Why even (laughs) have a deep end? We have all the time in the world. Now, you needed the ladder because you didn't have time once you hit the diving board, hit the water to swim all the way to the shallow end, walk up the stairs, and then go around. That would add precious seconds. Of course. You'd have to use the ladder, jump out of the pool, run around, hit the diving board again, and repeat, rinse, and repeat. So I think the ladder's gone because the diving board's gone. Yeah, well, deep ends are gone now. Deep ends are gone. But the, uh, yeah, and... I still know a couple of houses that still have the diving board because if you had one, they said, okay, you can keep it, mm-hmm. but we will not allow any more pools to be built with, with these diving boards. So there, I, there are a few select ones that I know if, if you want their numbers. Yes, can, I do. Can hit those boards. Um, by the way, what are you going to watch now that you have an hour free every night? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what am I going to watch? I love what, what, watching Tucker. Why don't you do a, a TV show that is a little that, that came out after 2000? Mm. Like maybe you get into the wire or breaking bad or yeah it's all good quality but quality doesn't help me <laughs> i need to either look at junk or sure. i need to be outraged by something and and I, that's that's how i roll i can't i cannot sit and just sort of watch quality be invested art. into yeah no. quality art that's no. fine i don't support that okay um so there's a uh, school bus driver who made the news. Oh, right. Yeah, did you see this video? He's out of Colorado. Um, so he's driving these kids. And th- this this new story will explain what happened. We'll watch a little bit of it. You guys need to be in your seats. On March 1st, at least 30 Castle Rock Elementary School students were riding the bus home. You guys want to see how dangerous that is? Oh, little brake check there. Yeah. Do you get that? That's why you need to be in your seat. Yeah. Turn around and sit down properly. Yeah. If you guys can't do that, you will get written up. Do you get that? He has that TSA tone. Mm, I like this guy. You do. The students yeah. ranging from kindergarten to sixth grade were confused and startled from the jolt. Yeah. At just anyway, you can pause it there. For Did he do it again? No, they just replayed oh, it. Oh, okay. So, um, so he... That school bus driver faces 30 counts of child abuse charges after some breaks to teach students a lesson. All right. Okay. All All right. They were going about nine miles per hour. Yeah. All right. Who gives a fuck? Uh, Lessons need to be taught and learned, number one. There is something in one of my books. This time I know it's in there. We are sort of nuts in that we are obsessed with seatbelts. Yes. Obsessed with seatbelts, and we're obsessed with children's safety, and we go nuts if the kid is not in a child seat and belted in and in cars I, and riding in I the back seat. I got a child seat. seat for my upcoming We baby. are Very. obsessed with seatbelts on an airplane. It's like, well, buckle up, hey, wear your seatbelt, yeah, even, if we're, even if we're not. It's, it's, it's insane. And there's one place <laughs> we don't have seatbelts yeah. and we don't care about seatbelts, and that's school buses. And they don't have headrests either. It was, I would say Volvo may have started the headrest thing. I mean, the sort of safety version of the headrest thing. But the headrest and the seatbelt have been required in automotive manufacturing for over 50 years. Yeah, You could not sell. Now, you could sell a you could sell a, a Nissan mini truck with a bench seat in it, like I used to drive from 1984. You could get away with selling that car because they had it designated as like farm equipment or something. It fell under the heading of not used on commercial highways or something. I mean, they knew it, it was, but it was designated as something. That's why you'd see those mini pickup trucks with no, no headrest mm-hmm. in them. But... Any other vehicle uh, that's been sold, it's been at least 50 years with headrests and seatbelts, and we're obsessed with it 
School buses do not possess headrests or seatbelts. Yeah. And it, all they do is transport and these kids. These are the people we want to pr- protect the most. We We're obsessed with protecting the kid. Did we just look the other way on, on school buses. How are they going to click it or tick it? I, yeah, how are they going to learn? Uh, anyway, I like this guy. You do? I do. <laughs> Look, I don't know. If, if the idea, well, first, okay. He seemed really annoyed. Okay, all right. Can I say this? Why do we want kids in their seats? Well, that that's the safest place for them to be. Right. So it's a, a safety sure. issue. So um, he explained what could happen in a safe way. But if he was going 40 miles an hour and was sideswiped or something, then kids could die. He wanted them to learn from experience. Yes, I'm all for this. Learn from it. Well. (laughs) Tough shit. The parents are really upset. Um, Why are the parents upset? Oh, they're mad. Really? One parent, quote, my son came tearing through the door that afternoon, sprinted all the way home. He was out of breath and red face and absolutely sobbing and shaking. He was terrified. First off, if you can. And the parent was scared to death. If you can sprint for five blocks, you ain't injured. You're probably okay. You're probably okay. Right. There was a girl who says that she she uh, her cheek was bleeding, bloody cheeks. Oh please! And uh, and then so parent when he dropped off the kid, he's telling to the parent like I think it's right here. He's like, oh yeah, these kids are running all over the place. I had to I had to do this. And by the way, he he says he was a substitute driver. He's like the past driver couldn't keep these kids under control, so I had to do it. Yeah. Good. (laughs) Listen, I don't know what everyone wants. A law, just fucking complete disregard for authority, Uh, because that's where we're at. I know it's, it seems like progress for everything, but you're seeing people just beating the fuck out of each other on school buses. Like we're losing it and we're losing it because we stopped being able to tell kids like what to do and like discipline them. And now right. those fucking kids are adults and we're fucked. All right. Sorry. What's he got here? Oh, so this is, yeah. So one of the kids called, uh, called somebody with on the cell phone telling them that, Oh yeah, we got hurt. Little the the, the brakes badly. Kids fine. Yeah. So this guy, he faces 30 counts of child abuse. One of the charges is child abuse with bodily injuries, which has a maximum sentence of about a year behind bars. Ugh. His uh, court appearance is expected next month. Yeah. Well, he's a Oh, hero. he's been fired, by the way. He's a hero <laughs> on my book. Yeah. I like this guy. Really? I, I don't know. I, I understand the point of slam, of, of doing that, and you're, you're going at a slow pace, but he seemed it seemed that it was all stemmed from anger rather than I needed to... Yeah, he seemed like he lost it a little bit. I, I, you know, I get it. I, I don't think I'd want to have a beer with the guy, but it's it, <laughs> it, 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 it. This all should be filed under the heading of who gives a shit. There's so much of this. There's so much of it that I don't even. I don't believe any of it anymore, which is not good. Yeah. When people go, hey, did you see that story with those uh, kids from that uh, school? Were like. Uh, harassing the porpoises like swimming after them and oh yeah, and yeah going after the porpoises you hear that story i go yeah yeah didn't happen <laughs> they, they go they're chasing you them. haven't even seen harassing the, the video i go i've heard i've heard enough yeah i've heard you shouldn't i shouldn't be that dismissive about almost everything did you You've deduced it, did yeah. you see that the cop uh he he plowed his cruiser into a crowd he was like a bunch of blm protesters this cop plot yeah yeah right yeah he they were jumping on the hood of the car and then he lurched forward. And then somebody on the hood of the car fell off right. next. You know, what's next? This guy slammed on the brakes and threw the kids into the, yeah, yeah. Zero. It's nothing. <laughs> it's, it's nothing. It's, it's file it under the kids swimming after the porpoises. It's right. nothing. It's nothing. And I'm so fucking jaded now that when someone is trying to explain what happened, I'm going to add in. Oh yeah. That yeah, didn't happen. You, no, you are. It, You've already it didn't happen how you're how you, they're saying it happened uh-huh. with everything now. Sad. It is sad. I wonder what uh, John McKinney would think. Will think about this story. We're going to ask LA. him if he was DA. What he would would he prosecute this guy? Yeah. All right. Um, there's a there's an Egyptian lawyer who has filed a lawsuit against Netflix. Yes. Yeah. So there's a Cleopatra docu series coming out, and playing Cleopatra is a black actress named Adele James mm-hmm. and lawyer Muhammad al Semery. He filed this lawsuit claiming that this is a distortion of history uh, because Cleopatra was not black. 
you got to look, the, the Egyptians, they just don't have a lot to hang their hat on. You know what I mean? And we got we got to throw them a bone every once in a while. You know, they don't have, you know, blacks, they essentially own the culture. You know what I mean? Like every athlete, every kid looks up to growing up is a black athlete. You know, it's like you guys, blacks got a, they got a lot of culture going on. Oh, you're saying so lean into the things that we are I'm saying paying attention to. I'm saying how many Egyptian guys are in the league? You know what I mean? How many Egyptian rappers or big acts? You know, like like I can't name any. All right. Coachella just came and went. You know, how many Egyptian acts were up there? How many how much Egyptian representation is at the Oscars or in the NBA finals or whatever? I'm saying you gotta give the Egyptians, you know, they they got a couple things. They got Cleopatra. And they got the pyramids and the pyramids. We didn't want to give them credit for because <laughs> we're like, you know, aliens could have been yeah, involved oh, with that shit. That sucks. I mean, how would you like it if yeah. you put a nice addition onto your house oh. and then I came over and you're like, hey, look what I did. I'm like aliens. And you're That'd like, no, I bummer. built this. Yeah. Maybe aliens. I don't really know that you're capable of putting on this now porch. I feel bad. <laughs> yeah. So we tried it. Here's what we do with the Egyptians. We go, look, uh, it's either aliens or it's slaves that, that built the pyramid. So pick your poison. <laughs> <laughs> I would take aliens at that point yeah. as, oh, a, ooh, as a culture. Yeah. At least it doesn't have the baggage of slavery. Get that S word out of here. Yeah. yeah. So about all they got is Cleopatra. Yeah, and so they're they're fighting for they're fighting for. So the role was actually originally meant to be played by Gal Gadot, mm. but uh, there was significant public backlash surrounding that choice, and Netflix was accused of whitewashing Cleopatra. Oh. So they went with a black actress, and now she's not Egyptian. So their Netflix is getting sued. I'm a uh, I'm all for any race playing any part or gay or straight or whatever you Any don't cat. have to be but now see here's the here's the distinction if it's a black woman playing cleopatra but she looks like cleopatra and she acts like cleopatra and no one is calling her black cleopatra she's just cleopatra um then that's that's fine because that's no different than you playing a gay guy sure, or vice versa or whatever, a gay guy playing a straight guy. Like that's just, that's just act. Act as if, yeah. And I actually find the trailer, Ben, find the trailer for Cleopatra Jones. There is precedent <laughs> you here. You just recite it for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Cleopatra Schwartz. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cleopatra Jones is an actual movie. Oh, right. <laughs> There is a lot of precedent. I would fight this case if I were Netflix by showing the trailer for Cleopatra Jones, which is like 70s black exploitation film. Right. Let's see if we can find if we can find it. It just popped in my head. I was like, Cleopatra, black Cleopatra. Oh. Guess you jumped out of the woodpile. Cleopatra Jones is... This can't be the trailer. The actual official trailer? Maybe it I don't know. 70s trailers were weird. That's true. She's driving. She's doing donuts in a Corvette. If I ever hear of you selling so much as a cough drop... Some hard cuts. <laughs> I'm coming down on you so hard. Tamara oh. adopts the Soul Sisters answer to James Bond and the most exciting new star in years. Six feet two of dynamite, and it's all stacked. I told you where! And I told <laughs> you when! Shelly Winters! I told you how to get that! Oh. Cleopatra Jones. She is sticking her nose in my business sack! And up against her is the arch enemy, the female successor to Goldfinger, two time Academy Award winner Shelly Winters. Wow. <laughs> Star power. Don't cry. 
about me, boy. You better put that down before I make you eat it. Well, I don't want this town to blow up. <laughs> All right. So there's Cleopatra Jones. Yeah. All right. That's a black woman named Cleopatra. Yeah. So there's precedent here. Bring that to the trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Johnny Cochran. Mm-hmm. Proud. All right. Um, let's see here. So there's some changes with the McDonald's menu. Mm. Really, it's burgers. Mm-hmm. So they announced changes to the uh, uh, Big Mac and the McDouble, among other things. And they claim that these changes will improve the flavor of their burgers. Uh, four main changes. Better, softer buns. Mm-hmm. Consistently melted cheese. Mm-hmm. A better sear on the patties. Mm. And more sauce. And they're going to... The, the American cheese and the melt is a very interesting ballet because it, it could get too melted uh, and it gets fucked up it if it gets a liquid. too melted yeah. it gets runny but if it doesn't melt enough oh yeah. it's bad times so it there is a very delicate dance with that i don't know like i'm not sure if mcdonald's should change because mcdonald's is mcdonald's like a hostess Twinkie is a hostess Twinkie. It's not. It it's not a pastry. It's a it's a Twinkie. Mm-hmm. There's certain things that people grow up on, and they get seared, pardon the pun, into their brain, like Sunny D or something. I, I have no fucking idea why people like that stuff, but it's like people like certain things because it gets for put in your brain when you're young sure. and like McDonald's is never going to be in and out burger. It's McDonald's. Like, I don't know if you'd want to screw around with that. I also heard they're uh, handing out sauce. So they're doing their secret sauce, which is uh, I used to apply with a caulking gun when I made <laughs> burger to give you caulking. Smart. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, yeah. Talk about this out with like their guacamole. <laughs> Yeah. Your guac should not come out of a caulking <laughs> gun. Um, yeah, so when was the last time you had a McDonald's burger? Uh, uh, I mean, honestly, 20 years. Like, I don't I don't okay. know. I'm just saying 20 years. Like, I never have a McDonald's burger. It does. I've probably had a bite. What, what you're going to find out is your kids are going to, or kid is going to fuck up your diet royally because <laughs> they do two things. They bring it all in the house yeah. and then they never finish it. Dawson already does that here at work. I know. And you cannot throw, I can't throw away food and now it's in the house. So you end up taking bites out of stuff that you shouldn't take bites out of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but you're right. I mean, yeah. Do they even need to change it? I mean, they're already the, the top dogs. It feels like so. Yeah. I wouldn't mess with it. They're now they're, they're announcing that they're changing it though. Um, so the U S airline industry is about to be a hit with a quote tsunami of pilot retirements mm. that furthers the uh, pilot shortage in the nation. Yeah. Yeah. So more than half the pilots working today will hit the mandatory requirement age of six retirement age, excuse me, of 65 in the next 15 years. Yeah, and now we're doing, we're trying to do all this affirmative action hiring yeah. stuff with pilots too, which is scary because, again, <laughs> you know, we're kind of funny. It, we're kind of funny as a nation. Like most people are like, um, Kamala Harris is a complete dimwit, but oh, let her be vice president. Like, really, who cares? Oh, what if she was your pilot? Oh, no way. <laughs> no way. It's like, yeah, just let her fuck up the country. I mean, that, who cares? But not pilot, not yeah. not my airplane. Like pilot was the example job of you know who cares who's hired, but you can't be the pilots. The pilots that has to be rigorous. There can't be affirmative action with pilots, and obviously they're going to get trained and go through their hours of whatever. But it's already starting to happen, and the the idea is is when it comes to pilot. I, I do not want them to factor in anything other than ability, anything. And we're starting to factor anything and everything right. into everything now. And there will be consequences. They should have those blind auditions like in the, uh, the symphony. The critic for the New York Times took a stance against blind auditions. Yeah, I know. 
I, I do like I do like when you're forced to take a stand against blind auditions and uh, and and in support of catalytic converters being stolen. <laughs> like I, this is a really sense. weird time that where you go ahead take a stance against blind auditions for the symphony and then you take a stance against Toyota as it pertains to a part being sawzalled off of their car. That's a very interesting position we're putting these yeah. people in. But they do it, They'll which is amazing. It. Do you think uh, Joe will keep Kamala? Does he have to? Oh, um, I don't. That's going to be interesting. I I don't know what he's going to do she, with her. she no, hurt his he case? Has he has to. He has to. He has to. Everybody hates her, though. I know, but the, I mean, except the people the you're going to piss Seattle. off, the people you're going to piss off if you take her off of the ticket, it could be so damaging. I guess, yeah. The ladies of the he view would not her. like that. Yeah, yeah, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, she's horrible. Yeah, or something. I don't really. I've never heard her say anything where I went like, "Yeah, yeah, that's smart." Right. It's, yeah, there you go. It's a safe Let's do that. Yeah, in. she's. There's also there's. Much like the people that don't know how to follow you, her problem, Kamala Harris's problem, could be summarized in her conversation with with Lester Holt. Everybody else focuses on the part where she was sort of lying and saying, we've been to the border. But the real thing that makes her sociopathic is her saying to Lester Holt, I don't know what you're asking. That was a bizarre mm -hmm. exchange because, yeah, I get it. You, you're appointed the border czar and you weren't going to the border. She can't say no, so she has to deflect. But you can say, um, yeah, I haven't got there yet, yet and I don't have my schedule in front of me, but obviously uh, it's something I'm deeply interested in and or... I don't need to go to the border. I have, I'm routinely in touch with border patrol and I talk to uh, my Arcus and I talk to, and they give me constant updates on it. She said, I don't know what you're asking. <laughs> we, you got to play. You got to find that part, which is, it makes, it makes her go from sort of out of it to sort of insane. Yeah. Because you're being interviewed by someone who wants to know if you've been to the border because you're the border czar and you don't know what he's asking. It's not an answer, nor is it an excuse. It's and it's a weird deflection where it, and she it, becomes it's 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 Gavin Newsom esque in that when he's being asked by the friendly NPR whoever, uh, what about people leaving California? It's like, hey. Where are you going to go? <laughs> what is it? What do you mean? Where? Are you? But, no sense, and then yeah. she's like, well, people are leaving all the time. What do you mean? Where are you going to go? And she, he goes, yeah, it's not my saying. That's Governor Brown saying. He would say that. It's not what I'm saying. As a reporter. And then, <laughs> then, then, and then she goes, and then, and then she goes, yeah, but, but so people are leaving. And he goes, hey, I know a couple and they uh, well, well to do, uh, well off. And they moved to Utah and uh, they got the kid, uh, in a school over there, and they uh, they seem to be happy. Might as well just be a soundboard. I'm just saying, it's not it's not a bullshit answer. It's an insane answer. <laughs> it's insane. You're being you govern a state where people are leaving the state. So the reporter says, "What's going on with people leaving the state?" And then you give an example of a friend you know who left. Because I think now people, when they listen. And or even when they speak, they pay more attention to tone and cadence rather than the substance of their words. One thousand percent. It's insane. His answer was insane, but her answers are insane. But so is the lady with the catalytic converter. Like this is we're crossing over. You got to find that clip. I don't know. The Newsom one or the Kamala one? The Kamala one. It, it's the part at the end where she starts laughing and once <laughs> doesn't know what he's asking. Yeah. That's the part that makes her wildly incompetent and possibly insane. It's not the part where she lies or tries to lie because that's what that's what politicians that. yeah, sure. <laughs> do. Like that's the part where she doesn't know what he's asking, and it's the part where Gavin Newsom gives an example about a couple going to Utah and never coming back as his reply to what are you going to do about people leaving the state? It's nonsensical. 
there's plenty of bullshit. Like, you know, Garagas has to defend people that are guilty and make sort of arguments on their behalf. But he doesn't make nonsensical arguments. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He makes arguments where you're like, eh, it seems a little far-fetched, but it's not. Just a touch. Puts a little spin on there, yeah. but it's not nonsensical. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Do we have that uh, clip or do you want to get on with it? It's really, I find it, I'm fascinated by this era we're living in. So it'd be interesting to see Biden do it. Oh, all right. I'm looking at you guys. You don't, don't, you don't I'll, have it. I think okay, that's fine. So it's okay. It should be, the Kamala Harris one should just be all over the place. No? Still looking. All right, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, we have our guests here. Do you want to? Yeah, those? we'll do one more, and we'll see if we can find this tape. Okay, sure thing. So there's a uh, there's a cat hunting competition for kids in mm-hmm. New Zealand mm-hmm. that uh, has been canceled now following backlash against the event. So um, this this uh, the category was for those aged under 14 to hunt the feral cats because cats. In New Zealand, feral cats are an invasive species. Yeah. So, what are they hunting them with? Uh, unclear. I think they'd shoot them. Mm-hmm. But they, yeah, they're told not to kill pets, just the feral cats. Yeah. And uh, for a prize. And the children, the, the child who killed the most would win uh, between mid April and the end of June. So you have a mm-hmm. you know, month and a half there. Uh, 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 155 bucks <laughs> for the kid. For killing 87 cats. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, you get a buck twenty-five a cat. Like, I, I, <laughs> what do you do with the cats? After? I don't know. You, and you have to like cut their ear off and make a necklace out of it, like you're in uh, Vietnam or something. Like, how do we prove this? Do you take pelts? Right. Do you take pictures? Yeah, I don't. How, do we, how are we? Yeah, how are we counting these bodies? I don't. Uh, I don't know. But, but look, of course, everyone's mad because we love cats. Yeah, everyone's mad. But if they're the species that doesn't belong there, one point two million domestic cats in New Zealand more than double feral cats. So there's double domestic than there are feral. Yeah, over double. Mm-hmm. No, sorry, over double feral cats than domestic. So there are about two point four million. Feral cats, 1.2 million domestic. Oh, cats. okay, okay. No. So yeah, so no, they've overtaken, they've overtaken New Zealand. Yeah, it is crazy that there's a bunch of you know cat 12 year olds with 22. Terrible. Oh, cat it's the urine. worst. The worst. I would shoot my cat even if I <laughs> love my cat. If my cat pissed on a mattress or something, that is the worst. It's so sharp. All right, we got uh, Lester here. All right. Now, really, listen to the part at the end where she doesn't know what he's asking. Okay. Do you have any plans to visit the border? I, at some point, you know, I, I, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole, this whole, this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. The royal weed. And I mean, I don't, I don't understand the point that you're making. Okay. Do you have oh. any plans? I, she doesn't understand the point he's she making. She understands. She just she. Do, I don't have an, a, an answer. Here All right, but you can't ever. come across like a complete fucking insane person. I don't understand the point that you're making. He's a seasoned reporter asking you. And she, been to the and border. She tries, it seems like she's trying to go on the attack. We've been to the border. We've yeah. been to the border. We've been. It's like, hey, bitch, you can say this two thousand times. It still doesn't get you to the border. Yeah. Oh my God! She's I trying saw to manifest it. By the way, I saw this tape and I was like, "Oh boy, we are fucked." Yeah, Ugh. that was that was an early. Good sign. luck with her, bud. <laughs> That'll be awesome. Yeah, I bet she'll get like, um, I bet she'll get like mono or something. I bet they'll. I bet she'll come down with like mono. Won't be able to. Won't be able to run or something. Oh, they'll, they'll do something. Yeah, they're gonna figure something because out. He can't say, "Oh, she's off because of." She's, everyone hates her and she's anything. horrible. Yeah, yeah they just go. She got oh. really bad case of mono. Or they reassigned her. She got. She decided to step down. Yeah, and do do something else. Yeah, yeah. The cabinet or something. Something. Yeah. Something. Well, they could have tried to put her in the Supreme Court, but they already did that. Oh yeah. So they can't get rid of her that way. If yeah. they do want to get rid of her, they'll have to replace her with another woman of color. Yeah, those are the new That's rules. That's the only way. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll talk to uh, Deputy DA John McKinney, trying to 
get a break over here in Los Angeles about what the hell is going on. But his very interesting story about how he grew up and where he grew up and so on and so forth. We'll get into that right after this. Well, Tommy John, the traditional 15th anniversary gift is crystal. But for Tommy John's 15th year, they're making it crystal clear. You deserve to be unbelievably comfortable. Every day I'm wearing mine right now. I will not leave the house. Well, I'll go commando, but that's the only time I go without uh, Tommy John. Especially if you're exercising, walking, hiking, rowing, running, anything. It's the best. And they have breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. Over 20 million units sold. Thousands of five-star reviews. Tommy John, they don't have customers. They have fanatics. I am telling you, try Tommy John. You will not go back. It's all backed by the best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free, guaranteed. Right, Dawson? Get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. 20% off at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Adam, it's Pete from Colorado. Everybody in the world has forgotten, but I remember the patent troll battle. Thank you, my brother. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Yep, we did battle with them, but the good news is, is we didn't cave and they folded and... We made podcasting safe for humanity again. John McKinney is our guest, and you can go to McKinney4LA.com. He's uh, running, looking to get rid of uh, who, George Gascon? That's right. Um, first off, your history is pretty, pretty interesting. You grew up where? I grew up in Passaic, New Jersey. And you lost both parents before the age of five or six? Yes. My mom passed when I was two. And then my dad passed away when I was five years old. And what was their story? What happened? Uh, both disease. My mom uh, died from cancer, and my dad had a heart attack. God, they in his forties, something like that. I my was parents, that young? my parents were a little older uh-huh. uh, than most parents. I'm the youngest of seven. Oh, okay. So they got started before yes, you. That's right. And uh, then you came out here, went raised by. Now I was raised sister? by my, my eldest sister, mm-hmm. who, uh, who's quite an extraordinary person. She took me in, and another sibling, by the way. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that she had three children of her own that she was raising as a newly single mother, so she went from being a married uh, mother of three to a single mother of five. Wow. And she raised us um, by working five, six days a week, tirelessly through sickness, and um, did a, a great job. You prosecuted the uh, Nipsey Hussle murder case, right? Yes. That was my last trial before I was uh, unceremoniously removed from the major crimes division and put in a assignment that I'm in today, supervising misdemeanor crimes. Right. So you did a lot of high profile, big time gang related stuff, very successful at it. And I've heard more than one story about people speaking out against uh, George Gascon and him disciplining them. That's right. Um, I did. I was in the uh, major crimes division, which is the highest most prestigious trial unit in the district attorney's office, which, by the way, is the largest local prosecuting agency in the country. So it's quite an honor to be in a unit of about 10 attorneys who are trusted to handle the most complex and serious cases in Los Angeles County. Um, And it was there that I did a lot of great work, I think, if I do say so myself, including the Nipsey Hussle prosecution. Uh, But after that case concluded, I got a fair amount of publicity And I think because I had already been speaking out against the district attorney's policies, he removed me from that assignment and put me in a small office in East L.A. 
Now, that is part of a pattern of behavior on his part because he is reportedly facing 20 different lawsuits, two of which have already been resolved. The first one, the county settled for $800,000 for retaliation against a senior manager. And the last one went to jury trial in which one of my colleagues won a $1.5 million judgment against him. The extraordinary thing about that case is it's considered the weakest of the pending 17 to 20 lawsuits. So the taxpayer, unfortunately, is going to suffer, you know, due to the vindictiveness of the current district attorney. Yeah. So speak out. He'll go after you. And it seems I and are, do you have a case pending as well? No, I, I think I had good cause for a case, but um, I've set my sights on replacing him as the district attorney. So my appeal to the public is um, to look at his record. Uh, it, it is a horrible record. Um, and look forward, look to the future, look to replace him with somebody like me who has 25 years of experience in the office, a quite unique background for a prosecutor and a record of excellence as a prosecutor. What am I missing in terms of the big picture? Like, we understand that a lot of big cities have these Soros-funded DAs, and they're going to try to change the landscape. You know, they have sort of a mission. I guess I guess the mission is there's just too many black and brown men who are being locked up, and it's ruining their future, and we need to fix this. We need to alter it somehow. But much like defund the police, there is a maybe a path to alter this, but it's not this. That's what it feels like to me. And then they try it. And then there's more people that get shot and killed. And then they're not sure how to course correct. Or is this what they want? I I never know. It's a bad sign when almost everyone I talk to goes, what do they want? Like, why are they doing this? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, I understand how businesses work. Like, plywood that's called three-quarter plies, not three-quarter stick, because Owens Corning or Weyerhaeuser or whoever makes the plywood wants more money. Like, I I get it, but I don't know what Gascon wants. Yeah, I can't explain them. And I can't explain the other cookie-cutter versions of George Gascon around the country It is true that they're all pushing the almost identical agenda, which suggests that this agenda is coming out of some centralized think tank someplace. Get elected, implement these policies from day one, pull back only when necessary. And what the the goal, the goal seems to be, or what they'll say their goal is, is decarceration. They want to depopulate the jail They insist that there's mass incarceration throughout our country and that the people who suffer most from this hysteria, they'll say, it's a hysteria of incarceration, are black and brown defendants, especially young men. Uh, But the policies that they implement not only do not stem the tide of the pathologies that lead to crime and incarceration, but it increases the number of victims, especially amongst the ranks of black and brown people. In George Gascon's first two years as district attorney, there have been 1,544 murders in the county of Los Angeles. 1,544 murders on his watch, which is a 15-year high in our county. 92% of the victims are black and Hispanic. Now, African Americans only make up about 9%, 9 percent of the county population, we account for 36 percent of the murder victims over George Gascon's first two years. You will not see that statistic in the L.A. Times. You will not hear anybody who is tied into the status quo of things talk about that record of failure. Yeah, well, I mean, it's in, it's insane that sort of in the name of equity for black men, you just got a whole bunch of black dudes dead. I, it's it's it all. But again, everything is a horrible idea. All the progressive ideas are, are junk. It, defund the police is the same. It's the same thing. All right. Good. You you want to defund the police because the def, because you say that the police prey on young black men 
when statistically they don't, but okay, defund the police, and then we got a bunch of more dead black men. Yeah, and, awesome. and, and let me say this. I don't lay the death of every person in L.A. County at the feet of the district attorney. There are a lot of variables, obviously, beyond his control. But the fact that he won't talk about it, the fact that he won't say, hey, there is a crisis of black and Hispanic young men dying in our community and we've got to do something about it. That's the problem. Where, uh, yeah, I know. He would tell you that white supremacy is the biggest problem this country has. It's a bizarre, weird world we're living in. It's not really, I don't blame them. I blame everyone who listens to them. They have no idea what the hell is going on. Poor Chris. I got to scream about this film every 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, we're playing a L.A. City Councilwoman who is angry at Toyota for making it easy to get her to get your catalytic converter stolen right. and blaming the car manufacturer. Do you know this insane person? Hey, do you work with this insane no, person? No, I don't know her personally. Nithya Raman, I That's think right. is her yeah. name. She's one of the newly elected city council people. And uh, the council took a vote uh, <laughs> to enact a new ordinance <laughs> that would make it illegal to possess an unattached catalytic converter, the thefts of which are exploding, not just in L.A., but throughout the country. And, it, and the vote came up eight to four with four against, including the councilman from my district, uh, and, and some of the rationale that the four who voted against this law gave was just simply crazy, including, well, we ought to blame Toyota because they make it too easy to steal the catalytic converters. <laughs> right. As I tell people all the time, um, and this is the part that scares me, and we should figure out the names of the four dissenters on this. And what was the name of the man from your district? Uh, Marquise Harris Dawson was right. one. All right. Here. Let me Mrs. Hernandez was another. Oh, keep going. Sorry. Um, Nithia, we already talked about. Um, Those are only three. Is there anyone there, elected but... named Gary anymore, or do we all have the crazy <laughs> names? All right, here's I, I the thing. I, don't, I forgot the fourth. All right. Yeah, well, Dawson, uh, Harris Dawson, Marquise Harris Dawson, he says, he was the one that says when somebody gets something stolen, the city should do everything we can to make sure they're made whole, not punish another person. Yeah. Absolutely insane. All right. Now, here's what I'm. Here's what I'm trying to put forth. A, why in L.A. do we have to be such wackadoodles? Like, why do we have to be insane? Who votes these people in? These people are challenged mentally, and we're letting them run the city into the ground, which is insane, but that's us because we're progressive or something. Uh, we'll vote for anyone who has three names, I've realized, in, in L.A. But the other thing is, is... Um, these people aren't just part of a blue ribbon panel that is in charge of the catalytic converter situation. They're in charge of everything. So you take this warped, rotted, bizarre, corrupted brain of these people, and then you apply it to every policy. This, this is insane. So this is like the guy who thinks he's Napoleon. He's not just in charge of mid mid medieval france or france he's in charge of all policy in your house this is shopping and <laughs> you know is is alarm on or yeah. and should we get the oil change for the car <laughs> these nut the jobs are in charge of everything not just catalytic converters that's the part that should scare everybody yeah and they control billions of dollars um and some of them, I think we have some good ones on the city council. We have 15 city council people in the city of Los Angeles, and then we have county supervisors. There are some serious people in that group, but there are also some very non-serious people who manage to get elected. And I think part of that uh, reflects poorly on how we put leaders in charge. Uh, you know, I'm running for office now, and one of the things that I'm learning as a first-time candidate is how important money is to who gets elected. Uh, experience counts for something. Knowledge counts for something, where you went to school, what you've done over the course of your life. It all counts for something, but after the money, right? So right. When, the, when the reporting comes out to see how much each candidate has raised, the ones who raise the most, regardless of everything else, are going to be the ones taken most seriously. And that's a problem if we want serious people in government. Well, so what I'm trying to kind of 
figure out, I'm just going to leave LA because it's a dumpster fire. But what I can't figure out is most people are normal. They're really not down with this bullshit. They're just not. They're normal people and they want what's sort of normal. They want law and order and justice and safe streets and they want all this stuff. And then there's the Los Angeles Times, which are insane. They've just become some sort of super left wing, you know, prop of the Democratic Party or something. And they're insane. And then there's all the people like my parents who grew up here who would just read the LA Times and go, yeah, I'm going to vote for that guy and I'm going to vote for that guy. It's like, don't you see what's going on? Like, don't you want normal? You, you walk out in front of your house, you see a pile of homeless people. Don't you? You don't want this, right? And they're like, no, but um, we're sticking with Newsom and Gascon and stay, stay, yeah. the, stay. We don't want to think. We, I, I don't know. What is that? Does nobody wants what they're peddling, but they keep voting them in. It, it all comes back to a lack of accountability. Uh, there, The LA Times, when I first got here, I, I came out here from New Jersey, as you mentioned, in, in the late 90s, in the mid 90s. And the L.A. Times at that time, and for you know many years after, was a pretty good newspaper, uh, and I think did a, a fairly good job of um, endorsing candidates for different offices. But as of late, uh, everyone knows it; it's not a secret that the L.A. Times editorial board uh, is just is in the camp. You know, they're embedded in certain candidates' uh, campaigns including Gascon, they, they make no, they don't try to hide the fact that he is their guy and they're going to support him no matter what. Now, there are some good reporters still, I think. I don't know how hard they have to fight to write a good piece, but every once in a while you do see some good reporting in the LA Times, but overall the paper is behind these non-serious politicians. Well, is it is it is the same thing happening to the editorial board as it is to the city council? We're just getting people in there that we're wondering that aren't maybe aren't as qualified, and they're the ones that have a say. Or are these established writers and editors that? I think we're going through something as a country. I I think we are going through something, and we're in the middle of it, so it's hard to see the end. I think it started sometime around 2012. I think it's been impacted by technology, especially the phones oh, and yeah. social media, of course. Um, it, 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 the country, I think, is reckoning with what is the right moral place to be on various issues, right? And race got injected into a lot of different debates in different areas, which race is such a powerful thing that it changes the entire conversation. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of being a racist or not a racist. Uh, but I think we're going to work through it, but it's going to take some time. But I, I'm a little bit maybe more optimistic than Adam. That I don't think LA, <laughs> LA's, it sounds like LA's you know. got to hit rock bottom. I mean, I drive, I just drive around. I just see campers everywhere and homeless everywhere. It's a mess. And LA, California and LA voters are just, they're too dumb or they're, uh, they're not dumb. They're Unless my mom, right before she passed, just went like, I don't know who Larry Elder is. I'm voting for Gavin Newsom. It's like, okay, just, just take it to the grave, honey. I wanted to read the the uh, city council people that I was worried they were going to be taken off the screen, but they're back. Oh, so the fourth one was Hugo Soto Martinez. Yeah, and, and there's the, Nith. The Thea Rama, Raman, who uh, we heard speak earlier, Eunices Hernandez, and Marquise Harris Dawson. Two two of the four have three names. Never vote for someone with three yeah. names. I don't trust them. <laughs> um, wh what percentage of people that are out there committing the violent crime are repeat offenders? Like I, I have this theory that it's really just a hand, small group of people that are just repeating and repeating and repeating all you're, of this. You're stuff. absolutely right, and absolutely they need right. to be taken off the streets. Yes, at some point. It, a lot of money is thrown at these offenders long before they ever see any real jail time. Right. So there's this mantra, buzzword, that's going around the city council now. Care before jails or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. so there's always something. <laughs> right. Uh, it, and I said, you know, obviously these city council people have never sat next to a prosecutor in court and looked at, each offender's criminal history 
to see how many times they've been arrested and how many times they've been placed on probation and how many times thousands of dollars in services has been offered to that person before they ever, before a judge ever thinks about imposing any real jail time. The guy shot Nipsey Hussle. What was his rap sheet You like? know, interestingly, uh, Eric Holder did not have a serious criminal history, documented history. What One thing people have to understand, and I think we all know this at some level, people don't get caught every time they commit a crime, right? Actually, right. police are very aren't very effective at catching people in a way that they can be effectively prosecuted anyway. Uh, I saw a statistic that said repeat offenders get caught about 10% of the time. Now, that number is somewhat arbitrary because who knows? Some people are really good at it and some people are bad at it. But the point being, we as prosecutors and police officers certainly know who on the street is committing a lot of crimes. Some of them are just very good at it. You mm-hmm. know, I have friends growing up who are drug dealers. They dealt drugs every day for years and never got arrested. There were others who were getting caught within days of getting out from getting caught the time before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but your point that a small percentage of people drive the vast majority of crime, including violent crime, is absolutely true. Yeah, so we should be invested in getting them off the street. Right. And, you know, was kind of, I had a conversation with uh, a very liberal friend of mine last night, and uh, he was explaining, like, he was going, you know, it's not right that um, folks think that, you know, just because this guy's a young black man, he's there to rob them or, or whatever it is. And I said, yes, except for if they're going to commit the lion's shares of the crime, then people are always going to think that. Mm -hmm. And then she said, and then he said he had uh, an older family member who uh, basically felt that way. And then uh, she got robbed at gunpoint by a black man in Westwood, of all places, uh, where you see where alma mater. That's is. right. Also one of the and safest I, neighborhoods. I know. And, and and now she thinks it more. And I said, yeah, she does. And then he said, I'd like to think that that he sort of explained to me, he was explaining to me that that man who held up that his, his, his loved one uh, was, he'd like to think he was a father who was trying to buy gifts for his, for his kid. And, and these kids are like misunderstood. So they come into Chicago and they, they act out, but it's really because they don't have opportunity. And I'm like, um, I said to him, look, uh, I didn't have a lot of opportunity when I was a kid either, but I wasn't a criminal and I didn't punch people in the head randomly. I just was poor. Right. That doesn't, make you a criminal because you're poor. I just said this the other day. It it drives me insane. And by the way, it's soft bigotry of low expectation. This is basically rich whitey making excuses. You do not have to be a criminal because you're poor. That's right. Historically, there's been many poor people in this country. And let's give all of the young people who are growing up in these lower economic neighborhoods credit that most of them do not engage in any meaningful crime to speak of. The vast majority. I was one. You were one. There are thousands and thousands of kids across Los Angeles today who don't have a whole lot, but they're not willing to use force and violence to take take from somebody else. Yeah, I would steal candy because I wanted candy and I didn't have money, but I wouldn't punch anybody and I wouldn't hurt anybody, but I would shoplift. Because stuff was expensive, and I never had I never had a penny, so right. that's I did engage in that behavior. But if you would have said to me, you know, hit that old woman and take her purse, I'd be like, no, yeah. And it's a weird excuse that politicians keep making that these kids they don't have enough, so they act that you know they. By the way, their criminal behavior is jumping on the hood of a cop car. It's not stealing food you know they just yeah. like, they don't have enough to eat it's like they got enough energy to jump on the hood of that cop car yeah and our policies are not helping them that's a big problem that i have with george gascon and say his policy to never prosecute anyone under 18 for stealing up to a thousand dollars worth of merchandise that is a policy of the chief prosecutor of los angeles county 
to not prosecute juveniles, even 16 and 17 year olds for committing misdemeanors, some of which in, involve quite serious behavior. But could you imagine what it would have been like if you were 12, 13, 14, and you had carte blanche to go out and steal up to $1,000 worth of merchandise with impunity day after day after day? It's like a game you're, show. You're yeah. hurting the kids, obviously. They need consequences. Absolutely. It's in, it's insane that you're destroying a generation of young people. And what do you make of uh, Newsom wanting to call the National Guard in to go to San Francisco? I thought these people were against the National Guard. Uh, what's the, what is that move? Well, I, I think we have a governor, um, and somewhere there's a, a, a campaign consultant of mine saying, John, stick to public safety. <laughs> but I think we have a governor that we all know has been running for president for a very long time. Right. Sure. So everything he does is calculated toward that end. Yeah, it's very long term. Mm-hmm. And I'm most disappointed with him on him signing a lot of bad criminal justice legislation, a lot of bad public safety legislation that's leading to the revolving door of criminality by people who commit the crimes over and over again. Um, no, I with him walking the streets of San Francisco, talking tough about fentanyl, well, stop talking and do something. That that would be my message to the governor. To a lot of people, really, but yeah. Like, did you hear, like, in Chicago when they had all those riots and the and you know, people got shot and they were jumping on the hoods of cop cars? The mayor-elect, Brandon Johnson, he, he said, In no way do I condone this destructive activity. However, it's uh, not constructive to demonize youth who have otherwise been starved of opportunities in their own communities. Yeah. Oh, okay. But see, you can't jump on a cop car in your own community. Well, or, he's, he's just like, like, hey, they've had it hard enough. What I we- I know. The, the, we're we're going we're going insane. Uh, I don't know what Chicago wants, but they're not going to get it. I mean, people are just people are just going to leave. Well, that's what we're they're doing that with leaving. Newsom, right? I mean, they hired the same per basically the same person to to lead their city again and Newsom like what makes it so attractive to him that he's not doing it doing anything. He's just saying stuff about Fennel, but he's not doing anything yet. The majority of the people love him and we want to keep him and we we like Yeah. What yeah. what is so attractive about that? Well, there's that? a certain showmanship to politics. If you look the part, if you speak the part, most people unfortunately go along with that politician. You said something earlier about L.A. voters. I had a lot of confidence in L.A. voters. Right? I used to distinguish L.A. from San Francisco. San Francisco had George Gascon before us and then Chesa Bodine. And then when Gascon came down here to run, I told people, L.A. will never fall for it. <laughs> They'll never fall for it because if for nothing else, they can look up there and see what his record was in San Francisco. It wasn't very good in any category. Mm-hmm. And then he came down here and he won, which shocked me. I mean, real well, maybe shock is too strong a word. It surprised me because I had given the electorate here more credit than to fall for somebody like him. I don't think it's going to happen a second time. But the the South Bay communities voted for Gascon. The West Side voted for Gascon. The black community voted for Gascon. The Hispanic community didn't. Hmm. Uh, by a margin, they voted for Jackie Lacey you look, when you look at those returns. But he won a lot of communities. Um, the Valley didn't vote for him either. You know, the Valley San tends Fernando to get it. Valley. About San Fernando Valley tends to get these things right. Uh, but a lot of communities that I think are otherwise a little bit more sensible fell for him. But then it was the summer of 2020. It w- we're in the th- throes of COVID. George Floyd got killed that summer, and that changed that race. Yeah. Uh, a lot of variables, a lot of factors led to that outcome, but maybe George Floyd's killing was the number one thing. Yeah, we're insane. And the problem with most of this stuff, I mean, the problem, I think the problem with the bigger problem is, is what we do is we go, uh, hey, something happens. And somebody goes, we need to replace the the wheels on the car with square wheels, not round wheels. And then you go, 
How's that going to help? And then I, go, I was watching CNN, and they're pretty fired up about it too. <laughs> and then I, t- I read an article in the LA Times and the op-ed that talked about how r- square wheels would be much better than round wheels. And then everyone goes, all right, let's oh, do it. Let's, let's, it. let's yeah. start converting that car. And then you get these idiots who live in Beverly Hills and Malibu all sort of all excited about square wheels. And then the next thing you know, the politicians are talking about square wheels and then people are protesting for square wheels. And then I sit around and go, oh, this is never going to work. This is never going to work. And they go, hey, what are you, bigot over there? You don't like square <laughs> wheels? We're putting pizza boxes on all. We're replacing it all. We're doing it. We're replacing it with a pizza box. And I go, okay, okay. It's, it's a horrible idea, but okay. And then they swap it all out. And then the car doesn't move, and this process takes a couple of years, and then they go, what's going on around here with this car? won't even move. And then somebody goes, uh, well, this has square wheels. And then they go, all right, all right, all right, look. First off, I was never for square wheels, the person <laughs> says. I said, I said, do the space saver spare square, but I never said do all the wheels square. That's not me. My opponent, however, wanted – we have thousands of hours of footage of you wanting square wheels on, on cars. But okay. So <laughs> tell you what we're going to do. We're going to place one of them with a round wheel. We're going back to one. We're going to take it slow. We're going to back take to – we're going to take a one – we're going to course correct. We're going with one round wheel on this car. And then I just sit around and go, I have no idea what you assholes are doing, but it's never going to work. It's going to end up with more of what you don't want. But I will just sit back and laugh. I will eat the pizza that was in the box that you're using as a wheel now. And when it doesn't go anywhere, then at some point you'll revert back to what works. Or you can be like Chicago, which is like, we want more square wheels. We want a triangle wheel. We want a triangle yeah. wheel on this car. And they're like, no, don't do no. The problem with Lori Lightfoot is she wanted the square wheels, but the new dude wants the triangle wheel on there. So we're going the triangle wheel. And then the guy who wants the round wheel is not going to be considered. Now, at some point, when the car goes nowhere, eventually people sort of make their way back back toward the round wheel but we have to sit and and do the retarded experiment first and then we can get back to the round wheel yeah i think that's a a great uh analogy (laughs) so Uh, so la in the form of you could be getting back to the round wheel you're a round wheel i am i'm a round wheel yeah and 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 i've been around for a, a long enough time that people can trust that I'm a, a reasonable person, I'm a fair person. Um, I'd be unique as a district attorney for Los Angeles County. There's never been quite anyone with my background. Yes. And I say that there there needs to be more people who grew up having to traverse the minefield that we all acknowledge exists for a lot of young people. We need more people who've done it to inform on how to do it. What we get instead are people who have not only not done it, but they've never even lived in the neighborhoods where it has to be done. And they're the ones making up the rules and saying, oh, you know, I'm an expert in this. So this is how this is what they need. They have no idea what those young people need. I know what they need because I I am them. Um, I don't know. Just a personal note, sort of. George Gascon seems like a weirdo to me. Like there's something... It com- completely lacks empathy. That's there's obvious. There's something right? weird about him, and I can't quite – maybe it's the frames of his glasses or the way he speaks or something, but there's something off about him. All right, John McKinney, you can go to the uh, website, mckinney 4 the number 4, LA.com, and uh, support this man. And uh, also, uh, you can go to amcrolla.com and uh, – Support me. I'm coming to do live shows everywhere. Where the hell am I going? So uh, don't forget, this Sunday we have the Meme Gods premiere. Then you're going back to Kimmel's Comedy Club in Vegas, May 11th. Mm-hmm. You'll be there in June. Oklahoma mm-hmm. City, New York, Solana Beach, Nashville, Huntsville. Got to pay Honolulu. those taxes. Yeah, go to amcrow.com <laughs> for that. And Tank Sinatra as well, Meme Gods uh, coming up. John, best of luck and come back and keep us updated. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And until next time, it's Adam Crow for Tank Sinatra and Max Patton and John McKinney saying mahalo. Mahalo.